without further ado, since we are talking about uh, the, we've talked about the macros, we've talked about the markets, and it is now time for us to talk about private investment and unleashing the animal spirits. This has been the big Beav, uh, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman has been nudging industry year after year to go out there and kickstart uh, investing, kickstart private capex. Are we seeing the return of the animal spirits? That's the big question. And to help us answer those questions, we have a veteran of many cycles in India, Mr. Keki Mistry. Thank you so much, Mr. Mistry, for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Keki Mistry. He's here with us this evening. Also with us, Mr. Vivedyanathan of IDFC First Bank. Mr. Vedyanathan, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And Manish K. Driwal of Kedara Capital, also here with us. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here this evening. As we get started, we heard a little bit from Samiran, and I'm just going to bolster that with some more data that's been put together by HSBC in terms of private investment. And as per the data that they've uh, passed together, uh, the private sector is investing, albeit selectively. And if you take a look at what the data is telling us, that both private, corporate, and household investment is higher now uh, compared to FI19. But what is driving that is essentially dwellings, buildings, and structures and that is commensurate with what we have seen as far as the home loan side of the markets are concerned. But uh, without further ado, Mr. Mistry, let me start by talking to you. We were talking about connecting the dots in the past as well as forecasting what the future looks like. We've got very optimistic commentary coming in here from both the macros as well as the market perspective. But unleashing the animal spirits, are we on the cusp of a private capex pickup? Well, first of all, let me say I'm extremely bullish about the Indian economy. I've said this time and again on various shows. I think India's growth that we will see in the coming decade will be a lot faster, a lot bigger, a lot of, lot uh, more, more, uh, more serious than what you've been seeing over the last 10 years. And I say this on the back of the fact that the penetration level you see of almost any product in India is so low compared to what it exists in the, in the rest of the world. I mean, if you look at financial services, for, ex for example, mortgages are about 11% of GDP. In most advanced countries, mortgages are over 50 to 60 to 70% of GDP. And in emerging markets, they're about 20% of GDP. You take total retail credit to GDP, it's around 18%. US is nearly 100%. So we are so underpenetrated that I think the growth that we will see in the coming decade is going to be monumental. Monumental growth. Mr. Vedinathan, would you agree with the thesis that's just been presented there by Mr. Keki Misri that we do see this underpenetration across different categories, across different asset classes as well in our markets? What is driving your thesis for growth in India? See, uh, first of all, uh, there's a massive financialization and formalization happening in India because of arrival of GST, because of uh, you know, digitization, and as a result of that, that in itself is a huge power that's unleashing in itself. And then when you, you know, overlay that on the fact that GDP is compounding at this rate we're talking about, uh, nominal basis, you can call it about 11% adding inflation, uh, you know, you put the two together, it becomes a really powerful force. You know, since we were talking about uh, uh, markets being on steroids, and as per Ramdev, his forecast is that this is going to be the decade as far as the capital markets are concerned. What does it mean for India's banking sector? You're already <laughs> finding it hard to, uh, to get deposits. If it is, in fact, going to go Nilesh's way, what happens to you? You know, a lot of numbers are flying around in the, in the past <laughs> session, so let me add two numbers to give, you know, set the context in perspective. You know, uh, I, I went back and st studied the size of the Indian credit market in 1994, around the time many of us may have started our careers. Uh, and it was, it's crazy, it's 1.7 to 2 lakh crores, which is about the size of our bank today. It was the entire Indian banking system in 1994, okay? It's insane to even think about it. And uh, by 2004, it was about 8 lakh crores. By 2014, it was about uh, 60 lakh crores. And 2024, it is 160 lakh crores. 
And in the last 10 years, Shireen, India has seen almost every crisis you might have thought about, right? First, there was this, you know, 10 to 14, there was other issues about slowing of economy and all that. Then 2016, there was GST, uh, uh, demonetization. Then 2017, there was GST, uh, uh, which eventually is a good thing. And then uh, 2000, uh, you know, then we saw ILFS crisis, then we saw the uh, COVID. After all that, GDP is, uh, the banking credit has grown from 60 lakh crores to 160. So our own estimate is, our internal house view, is that even if this compounds at 12% for the next 10 years, uh, this could be uh, like a 3x from now, which is like a 480 lakh crores. So that sort of a big story is coming, and it's only going to be constrained by the extent of deposit growth mm. and not by the demand uh, of credit. Well, that, that is the big constraint that I was actually asking you to comment on. But, you know, you talked about uh, the size of India's banking sector. And I think this was a point that Manish was making as well, that if we aspire to get to 8 to 10 percent growth, is India's banking sector going to be able to fund that kind of growth? And I want to get both you and Mr. Mistry to comment on that. I'll start with you. So we start with me. So the banking system, uh, you know, just to put the again, numbers in context, India's net worth of the banking system today is quite strong, it's 25 lakh crores. The banking system making a profit, profit after tax today is the highest in its history, of 3 lakh crores. It's a profit that's accumulating as, as net worth every year. Uh, NPA all-time low of like 3.5% or so gross and maybe net of less than 1%. Um, so basically, uh, you know, and, and more importantly, the governance conditions around banking system has become very, very strong. So I think uh, Indian banking system is a very, very strong position mm. to support the growth of the future. But does it have the size, Mr. Mistri, to, to fund the aspiration that we have? In my opinion, yes, it has the size. You talked about deposits. Look, these are cycles. If you go back to the last 20 years or 30 years, I don't have the data at the back of my mind. But if you look at the last 30 years, there have been various points of time where deposit growth has been slow, loan book growth has been high, and vice versa, loan book growth has been slow, deposit growth has been high. So this is a cycle. You see, you, you look at it pre-COVID and look at it post-COVID. In pre-COVID, if you were in a small town and you had 2,000 rupees mm. with you, what would you do? You'd walk to the nearest bank, put your money in the bank account. But with COVID, everyone started having smartphones. Everyone started seeing what opportunities were available. People started, and then you had platforms like Zeroda and so many others which have mm. come in, which give you the ability to trade in the market. And people are seeing that that, that stock markets have done extremely well. So the opportunities for investment for people has increased. It's no longer just bank deposits, there are multiple uh, opportunities. But having said that, savings in India will rise in my opinion. Phases will happen, there will be periods of time when for whatever reason, I'm, sure I'm bullish on the stock market, but for some reason if stock markets were to underperform, <clears throat> you'll again see a flight of money coming back into bank deposits. So I'm very confident that there'll be enough liquidity available in the system to fund the growth that India needs. And I think RBI also has been tight in terms of holding liquidity because of inflationary worries. Once they get a sense, for example, in the current year that the monsoons are reasonably normal, there is no geopolitical issue to worry about, oil is not going to go to $120 type, then I think more liquidity will flow back into the system. I don't think shortage of liquidity will stop the India growth story. Sharon, let me add one last yeah. point to what KK is saying, just to put that number in context. Even when I said that the Indian credit market will grow from 160 lakh crores to growth, a deposits growing at 12% is not really, you know, a, a fanciful number. So really, if this deposit growth, which is about 200 lakh crores, grows at 12% per annum, the credit of this number of 3x of today, <coughs> th excuse me, 3x of today can be achieved in 10 years. And that will unleash a lot of power to the Indian economy by that time. Well, since we're speaking about unleashing the power of the Indian economy, Manish uh, Kejriwal, let me get you to comment on that. You know, what are the themes that you believe will drive growth? What are the themes that you're going to be betting on as far as the next decade is concerned? Um, Sharon, thanks again for having us here. I, I, you know, I just want to start off by saying the big difference that I see when we first started investing in India almost 20 years ago in the Tamasic days, and I'll give some comparisons, was I think it goes back to what Chukani said, right? You believed in the quality of the Indian entrepreneur. Just unleashing the energy, which at that time was capital staffed, equity staffed. Uh, today, that's changed. You know, at that time, there were very few uh, potential sources of equity, which caused some of the behaviors that you talked about. 
Today, there's a very viable and a flexible and a burgeoning venture capital industry. There's a growth capital, extra. there's a private equity industry. For the first time, there's a significant amount of exits. So you're giving money back to your investors. I mean, there was a joke when we were raising our fund. What does the word DPI mean? DPI is the amount of capital you give back for every dollar you invested. The story in India by the LPs was, hey, you, do, you took capital away, but am I supposed to give it back? That's somebody else, right? That's actually changed significantly. And the markets, thanks to Ram Agarwalji, thanks to other investors, today, when you look at large blocks to exit, I mean, KKR exited more a billion dollars that, uh, of stock in Max Healthcare overnight. That was unprecedented. But if I just step back to your question and see, the big, other big change, which we used to say in the end of, um, after the GFC, maybe the early part of the last decade is, we're investing despite the government. This was, they were headwinds. And we say we'd still go out there. I think the big change, though we can't depend solely on that, is that strong headwind has become a gentle tailwind. Right? Are there issues? Of course there are issues. But by large and far, and KK will know this a lot better, but it feels like you support it. There's the rules, the IBC, or it's uh, uh, the GST. Um, so it, and when you look at the level of, you know, just look at Bombay today. The coastal road, the Trans Harbor, uh, the metro coming up soon. It's you know four, seven minutes from my office to Express Towers. Unprecedented. I want to go back to Express Towers. <laughs> I don't want to be sitting in Worley anymore. But it's an actually a magnificent change that each of us could see. And the last thing I'll leave with you is just the strength of our rural economy and this absolute scale. I think Ramdeji was saying this earlier today. If I was a global investor, firstly, I don't subscribe that all the money is running into India or China shut down. It's going to, that's not true at all. It's going to take time. It's going to be driven by performance. It's going to be driven by discipline. And if we go into some of the bad habits we had in the past, I think we'll, it'll be a lost opportunity. But just to keep the scale, I used to, before we started Kedara, about 12 years, 12 years ago, I used to, we set up the first office of Temasek outside of Singapore, large Singapore sovereign. And there, there was a phenomenal leader who said, instead of investing domestically, let me sell down Singapore assets and invest in China and India. Very simple thought. But it's taking a megaton tanker and moving it around. One of the first companies we invested was, uh, was ICICI. I remember Shirin teasing us and saying, you know, what's going on here? Could you take over Hora Ikea? But at that time, if I had two comparisons, we used to compare Singtel, one of us, and Bharti. We used to compare DBS, which has done performly, it's, yeah. it's done phenomenally with Piyush. We used to compare it with both HDFC and ICICI. I think the ratio in market cap in 2004 or five was 15 to one or 10 to one. I mean, I don't even know what the numbers are today, but I'll tell you 10 years from now or five years from now, it'll be 10 to one or 15 to one, the other way around, driven. Good corporate governance, mm. basic growth, the fact that housing and mortgages and hundreds of other products, I mean, to me, financial services is the lifeblood of the economy. It's a leverage play on the economy. And if you play financial services well, you're basically playing every sector. Yeah, well, that, that uh, is a valid point. But Mr. Mystery, since we are talking about the fact that there has already been many changes, structural shifts that have happened that have provided a much more enabling environment for Indian entrepreneurs. But, you know, the point that Manish was also making, and he talked about uh, the, the privatization uh, aspect, and in many ways also the privatization of monopolies. Uh, as you look ahead, uh, you know, what are the changes in addition to what we've already seen the government do to facilitate uh, a thousand flowers from bloom? I think the one reform which probably will get some focus, and I think Manish uh, talked about it, uh, which will get focus in the, in, in after the elections, will be labor reforms. I mean, if you are to really grow, you need proper, you need better labor reforms. To my mind, that is the one area which is still pending. But really, I mean, is that, is that a constraint? Are labor reforms truly holding back industry from employing more people? To some extent, it is. But I think also I should tell you that from a regulatory standpoint, the focus that is coming on things like ease of doing business, getting things done faster, I think it is phenomenal. 
I'm, I'm, on, I'm chairing one of the SEBI committees on this, and there is so much, of fo so much of focus, so much of attempt being done by the regulators all over the place, not just SEBI, but all the regulators, to try and make the process of doing work simpler and simpler. So I think easier work conditions, some degree of labor reforms, I think these are the things that will come through in the coming uh, coming. So the unfinished reform agenda, what would you put down on the wish list? Of course, the aspiration is that there should be less friction in everything related to doing business and, you know, take forward the ease of doing business even further. But if I were to ask you to specifically list out for us what else you would like the government to do for policy intervention to do to make changes? <clears throat> See, I think, uh, apart from the very important point said earlier, uh, the small enterprises in India have had a very hard life and a very hard deal. Uh, because the large corporates, uh, you know, because by size, scale, brand, are able to, you know, attract the best talent and get interest, interest at a very low, low interest, borrow, and so on. Uh, the small enterprises are, are still having a tough time, of course, made better the last few years, but still hard life. So I think that uh, the, the tax structure of India being uniform across the corporate sector sometimes doesn't sit well with me. I always say that small enterprises, uh, you know. Low rate of tax? Low rate of tax means like start a zero tax. You, you, you make up to say, you make up to 10 lakhs of income, you pay zero tax. Uh, I can tell you this, a lot of, this next generation of people want to become entrepreneurs if they're in a tax free economy. Economy. And progressive, progressive basis, let them all be like us, like 25 percent. I mean, I really wish for this, by the way. Well, the, the, let, let, let's see if that is something that the government intends to take up in any form or fashion or not. But Manisha, you know, to address your issue and many of the concerns that the VCs have had, private equity has had, uh, you know, with the angel tax and so on and so forth, some issues have been resolved. Many continue. Uh, again, this back and forth on capital gains, whether we will see a review, we won't see a review. We don't know what the answers are. Perhaps we will know this budget or the next but you know uh, what's what's your wish list looking like at this point in time actually Sharon it's relatively simple I, I think the known issues are are evident to everyone in the industry and amongst the regulators the reality is the RBI the SEBI and the F the finance ministry cannot always be looking at the same direction we hope they would be they can't that's the reality of life I think this last five or six years, I would say at least the issues are discussed honestly and the reasons why they can or can't be done or can be done slowly is also relatively clear. Actually, my only wish list, it's not asking for a much lower rate of taxation or no taxes on ABCD. For me, it's consistency of policy. I don't want us stacking left, right, and left, right again. I would love, for example, this might sound like a heresy, but instead of having an annual budget, to have a budget every three or five years. Why do we need an annual budget? We just give a longer term direction, policies against it, and we move in that direction. Not very dissimilar to where we might be moving towards uh, sort of elections at the state level and the central level. So maybe that's utopian, but that's what I think is. Yeah, don't do away with the big day for us here on CNBC TV 18, uh, <laughs> Manish. Uh, that's, that's one of the biggest events on, on the calendar. Uh, but free yeah. markets, the current approach of the government of the country saying that investment in infrastructure, investment in digital infrastructure, uh, free markets, right wing economic thinking with uh, you know, benefits going down the bottom of the pyramid. This, if this model changes, we have a big problem. I think uh, it's really in interest, interest to stay this for 20, 30 years to, uh, to keep going ahead. Uh, but, you know, to be fair, we have seen economic policy continuity irrespective of whether we have seen regime changes, where, you know, the 10 years of the UP and the 10 years of the NDA. We didn't see any significant disruption in terms of economic policy. We have, of course, seen additions like privatization being put back on the table as far as the NDA agenda is concerned, but, of course, slow moving. And I don't know whether 400 will necessarily change that. Mr. Mistry, do you believe that 400 potentially could change the, the course of the reforms that the market has been anticipating? I don't think so. I, whether it's 400 or it's 350 or 450, whatever, whatever be the number, I think the focus on reforms will be there. I'm, I'm, I'm very confident of that. And I think also as we move into the next financial year, and with India now part of the global bond index, both JP Morgan and latter part of the year uh, Bloomberg, you'll see increasing amount of dollars coming into India. Mm. And that would give RBI the, the ability to manage the rupee 
even more, even, even better, and it will find a way of flushing more liquidity into the system. So I think all in all, reforms will continue, and the growth opportunities that I see will be will will. But, but let's you know tie that down to specific investment ideas and investment themes on the back of what you've already put your money into and private equity. You know, from healthcare to microfinance, uh, we've seen money coming in everywhere. What do you believe if you are continuing to be as bullish as you are on the growth story? Where do you believe foreign capital, specifically as well as the unlocking of domestic capital, where is that money going to go? Fair. Um, I, I think the way we look at life. Uh, firstly, I think one of the biggest negatives on the flow of capital would be a more hawkish perspective from the Fed in the U.S., right? That, that is the context. Assuming, I think we're all assuming right now that it's going to get more dovish. Interest rates will come down. It'll be more attractive not to pull money back into the U.S. and spread out the world. Now, once the money comes here, what are you trying to do? <clears throat> For us, the two sectors which seem most exciting, valuations aside, are, has always been for the last 20 years, financial services and specific sub-sectors within financials. We used to do a lot of lending. We did banks, we did, uh, mama, we did microfinance companies, we did pure lending from NBFCs. Increasingly now, if you look at insurance, health insurance, general insurance, or asset management, from what Keiki said, where the mortgage market shares are, it's even smaller, so the growth is that much larger. Second, for us, has been consumer and consumer tech. Vishal, which he mentioned, is a great example of a company which we bought seven years ago. It's grown, it has a property of more than 500 crores. It'll be a blockbuster IPO whenever that happens. Right? And the reality is we're being rewarded by the markets and providing exits to our investors. That is the constant. You have to be disciplined in our industry. At the end of the day, it's not our money. We're simply a proxy for a bunch of global family offices, pension plans, and the others. So it's based on performance. And then, interestingly, a lot of tech, tech services, and healthcare and health services. But my overall theme in all this is the penetration level, the opportunity is huge. The way we have to be careful to avoid mistakes is in, our, in private equity, it's bottom up. It's to avoid a bad governance. It's being able to see, it's being on the ground, yeah. feet on the ground, and you'll see the returns coming. Well, uh, that certainly is the hope. Uh, but, uh, Mr. Mister, you know, we were talking about the investment engine, but also on the point of the consumption engine, and we've seen disparity there. At the top end, I mean, things are flying off the shelf like we've never seen before. At the bottom end, the pain continues. You know, what is the, what is the forecast? What's your own prognosis about when we start to see convergence? My sense is uh, after the elections, because if, we, if, if RBI is confident about the way uh, the monsoons are panning out and there is no geopolitical risk or, or geopolitical risk subside, I think you'll start seeing interest rates coming down. So I've seen many analysts talking about cutting Amiran rates. says October, nothing before October. I'm not so sure. My personal view is could, could be before October if the monsoon outlook is good and there is no geopolitical issue. I think it could be before October. See, you have to look at it from, a, from, the, from the perspective of a lower middle income person. Let's say he's taken a, a, a loan in 2022, a housing loan in 2022. The interest rate on that loan at that point of time was 7.5%. Rates have gone up by 250 basis points in the last one year. So this individual is now servicing that same loan, not at 7.5%, but at 10%. Yeah. The difference between 75 and 10 is 33%. So his cost of servicing the loan is up by 32%. So these kind of things have impacted people. But I think liquidity will flow back. Interest rates will come down. And therefore, I would be reasonably bullish to say that the consumption will also pick up. Even the low-end consumption will pick up. High-end consumption, expensive real estate, yeah. a lot of that is linked to the stock market. Yes, and the wealth effect that Ramdev was talking about, but uh, rate cut? Wait till October, pre-October. When do you see that coming in, Mr. Vedinathan? Well, you know, <clears throat> you heard, heard all views are, are all house views somewhere in between. Uh, but the thing is that uh, we, we should really look through the cycle. You know, at this point of time, the bigger issues to watch out for, really interested is a cycle. Like it'll what? Go, it'll go up and down. Bigger thing is to watch out for is, is discipline. You know, the fact that...
the way you're having this conversation around, everyone is so bullish about India. That's a problem, People is are, it? That's not a problem. It's a good thing because it, it brings out the spirits. Uh, uh, but at the same time, you know, um, uh, uh, it just uh, brings on us the... Uh, we need to have the discipline to not gorge at things and, uh, so you know... So the RBI nudging banks to look at credit deposit ratios is, is, a, is a way of the regulator sending a signal to banks and banks... Yes. Quarter on quarter, if you look at the numbers, clearly the banks have taken the message. Yes, they have and they should because end of the day, end of the regulator has seen so many cycles and we respect that wisdom. And uh, and therefore, uh, you know, this commentary coming from RBI asking people to slow down and calm down, I think, so, of course, I agree it's a good message. So and how I, and much, how much more calming down is needed or how much more calming down should we expect? No, the, the thing is that, uh, you know, the, the key thing is that to stay in control and still grow will make this a sustainable story for the next 20, 30 years. You know, like someone said earlier, we shouldn't crash and burn. So I, I do think it's a good thing. Is, is that, I mean, what the odds of crashing and burning at this point in time, I and mean, we've already seen the regulator come in <coughs> on unsecured loans, come in on credit deposit ratios as well. Is the fear of crash and burn a palpable fear today? Well, on the ground, the truth is that the credit behavior is really very good. You might see an optically the credit credit cost going up in the next financial year for most players, and that's because the fact that you know when you do like year to year comparison, you got recoveries last year, not getting recovery this year. Technicality is the part. The fact is that uh, at the grassroots level, the consumption story is strong. India's credit, uh, personal credit to GDP is very low. It's still 70 to 18 percent. US is still at 70, 80 percent. So it's a big story, like Aki pointed out. The fundamentals are very strong. But to the point we just said earlier, uh, uh, to have the discipline to work within the guardrails uh, is really very important. I, I think it's a good thing, message coming, and I think everybody's hearing the message. Everyone is hearing the message. Mr. Mistri, are you worried? N no, I would, I would add a little bit to what uh, Vaidya said. I think firstly, we must compliment RBI for the measures that they've taken over the last uh, five, six years. The way they handled the economy during the COVID period, not just flushing liquidity into the, and the government also, of course, government and RBI, not flushing liquidity into the system, letting uh, inflation get out of control, all extremely well managed. The, the balance sheets of bank, or balance sheets of the corporate sector today are a lot less leveraged. Yeah significantly less leverage yes. than what they used to be in the pre-COVID days, which means that the quality, the asset quality of the banking system has clearly improved significantly. Improved significantly. And I think the last number I saw was 3.2 or 3.3% gross. And I think as Baidia said, net is under 1%. So all in all, banking system is strong. Uh, leverage level is low, but the RPI has to be watchful, has all the time to be, make sure that there is no here, no possible risk that is coming into the system, and therefore the measure they took in November when they increased the risk weight on unsecured yeah. loans. So you may see some of these things happening. This is not that there is a problem in the system, it is to preempt any problem happening. Yeah, so, so being vigilant at this point in time to calm things down, uh, in, in, in your words, before, before things get too hot or out of hand, I am going to throw this open now uh, to, uh, to Mangalam and Sonal for, for questions uh, from our participants as well. Mangalam, over you. Well, you know, this was uh, incredibly insightful and the thing that stood out for me and it could perhaps mean a full circle as well, Manish, you said that when you were looking to invest in India, you looked at some of the Indian listed companies, compared them to global companies and saw the ratios were much in favor of India. But now as we speak, you know, the CEO of Whirlpool recently said that they're doing a valuation arbitrage with India where they're selling the Indian stock to buy the global stock. So how do you justify those valuations? No, no, I, I listen, I think ultimately, uh, when you look at valuations in India, and each one to their own, right? But it's driven, people are focused on revenue parameters, profitability parameters. People forget the whole concept of ROCI and ROIC. How efficiently is the capital being deployed? I think a Whirlpool or a BAT or a Unilever does what they have to do. They have significant corporate priorities. They see... It's no different than our promoter selling the underlying opco and buying a discounted holco, right? So you do the same thing in a global market. You'll sell uh, the BAT subsidiary here, which is ITC, and buy more. Th that is their board's discussion. I think if you look at from a risk-reward perspective is how global allocators look at equity. 
they say, okay, there's a certain amount of capital that we have which we need to make returns on. Where are we seeing the growth? Where is there a large market? There was a concept some Goldman guy came up with called BRICS. I mean, where is BRCS today? There isn't, right? Now, I'm not a blind Indophile to saying all money would go into here, but today it's difficult to avoid the country, right? I think in the past there were historically issues, whether regulatory, whether transparency, a huge amount on governance. I think at an average level, and I'm mean, both uh, Vedi and Keki see a lot more corporates than we do, but I would see the average level of governance has increased tremendously. And it's not that people have suddenly become better. Promoters themselves realize, Agar oge, you'll get a better multiple for your company. So I think in a sense, it's horses for courses. So global companies should do what they have to do given their priorities. But as far as the India story is concerned, I think the decade is yet to start. I just add a little bit to what uh, Mani said. One is when you're looking at valuation, you have to look at, the, look at valuation in the context of the growth. The growth opportunity that you will get in India, and you talked of financial services, and I completely agree. In my view, financial services is where the growth will be the maximum. The valuations are not that expensive when you look at the growth possibilities that are there. That's one. And secondly, to just reinforce the point that Manish made, which is at the governance level, we see this all the time. In 1980 or 1985, when you used to lend to a company, governance, honestly, in many cases, was a big issue. Today, when we lend to companies and we see how much focus these companies are placing on governance, because they all realize that if they are well governed, they are perceived to be well governed, they'll get that valuation, they'll get that, uh, you know, markets will be interested in that. Well, that certainly is the governance premium praying itself out. Sonal, over to you. Uh, well, you know, there are a lot of Gen Zs and millennials in the audience as well. And one word that is the buzzword is entrepreneurship. Everyone wants to do something new. Everyone wants to earn a lot of money. In that case, Manish, tell me what is one sector or few sectors which you think are untapped in India right now, which have a lot of potential, but we have not seen it yet there. Listen, I am not an early stage venture guy, which is cool and fancy. <laughs> We're like boring smokestack industrial. We don't <laughs> look at companies boring. that turn. You're uh, calling yourself boring. Or, I, I am, I am, I am. But the reality is you can take almost every sector and subsector. Take financial services. The amount of stuff going on on the fintech side, it is fabulous. And you know, the, and if I look at consumer and consumer tech, we have a small company called Purple we've invested in which, at least in the rural areas, beating the daylights of the market leader, who happens to be a very good friend, so I won't use the name. But the, you're seeing every potential. But I think the reason for that is different, Sonal. It's because the old fallacy of, Are, agar company kharab ho jayegi, barbaad ho jayenge, and we'll never be able to start another company. I think that's the mindset change that has happened. Mm. And frankly, for us as private equity, a lot of the, invest the investors, and I mean this seriously, is essentially first and second gen entrepreneurs who are not able to se uh, convince their kids to go into the smoke smack industries that they had started in the 80s and 90s. And we are essentially not solving an investment problem, we're solving a succession problem. And good luck to gen the, the Gen Zs for all the ideas they're creating. And I think the two is, uh, one is this, there's no longer a shame for failure. Yeah. Secondly, the availability of capital. Okay, there's a bit of this thing called the funding winter and all that, but that also is a short time thing. It'll, you know, it's the last two years because there were excesses. It's probably a good thing we had a funding winter. Now we'll have some funding. She'll come up with a funding spring or a summer, right? <laughs> it will happen. So that's a cycle across the time. To me, the best part of this is no, no bad points for failure. You can do it and try it again. And availability of capital, which are the two biggest sources of the entrepreneurial uh, juice in India. Okay, we, we totally take that point, but we do have a lot of people in the audience who would like to ask some questions, so please uh, go ahead. Anyone who would have any raise questions? Your hand. Yes, uh, please raise your hands. The we have Oh, here. yes, please go ahead. Yeah, so, you know, hopefully, say, 10, 20 years from now, when we do the 50th year of CNBC TV 18, we'll have some of the new age entrepreneurs sitting like you all and Certainly talk about not us. <laughs> Certainly not us. You'll be there. <laughs> You'll be there till the end of the time. But, you know, uh, Prashant here makes a lot of money when corporates make a lot of money. So he has a question about the animal spirits, the return of them. Prashant makes the money irrespective. <laughs> 
So I have a question for KK in particular, but also relevant, and uh, I would like to hear the answers from both Vedya and Manish as well. One but a very specific question. Uh, obviously, in financial sector, like in other sectors, over time we've had ownership restrictions, like in insurance, starting with 24, then 49, and so on and so forth. In, in banks also, there has been a 74% uh, restriction. I would like to hear from you what have been the benefits of that, and is, are we at a time that we should reevaluate that restriction? In my personal opinion, honestly, I mean it. I think we should relook at it because, in any case, there are governance norms. RBI has laid down limits that no individual shareholder can own more than five percent, or in certain cases, ten percent of the equity of a bank. So there are checks and balances which are already there in place. But if you just change that seventy-four to hundred, the the amount of additional money that can come into India. 100 not, plus billion. Exactly. Not as so huge amount of money can come in, not necessarily directly in equity, but through these passive funds. Because the weightage in the MSCI would increase significantly. And I might just add there, much larger would be the inflow from active funds as the weights in the indices yeah. go up. Yeah. Active, yes, but I'm saying even active apart, passive also. Anybody else wants to chime in on that? Nothing, since he's insisting on my comment. See, when we talk of India's $35 trillion economy in 47, right? Imagine even if the same credit to GDP ratio at that point of time, India will need a credit so-called book of at least, say, let me say, uh, $25 trillion. And for that, you will probably need equity of maybe about uh, two and a half uh, to $3 trillion. So uh, we should therefore make our policy in such a way that attract that kind of capital. And I do not think all that capital can come from India through domestic sources alone. And therefore, we should always be conscious that our uh, of our capital requirements, and without capital, you will get strangled. And uh, this is something you should be aware where our policy should gear to be able to originate foreign capital additionally to be able to meet that demand of credit for the country and take a GDP there. Otherwise, your GDP will actually not get there because you won't have the fuel, fuel to get there. What's in, yeah, you, I, 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 the only thing I'd add, Prashant, is um, I, there were regulations at a certain time for certain reasons. I would say two things have changed since then. The Indian company, let's take insurance. It's been 20 years. We have, you know, they needed actuarial data from other places. We have that now. And I think the companies are strong enough to stand their own. And I would go with KK that absolutely all restrictions should be relooked at, not for the point of attracting foreign capital. Both foreign and domestic capital will come. My only point, and it's a larger point which I like just stating out there, is from a regulatory perspective, sometimes the rules today are made to catch the bad apples, right? Often what's going on with the rules is the baby gets thrown out of the bathwater, right? So one should just be careful as we are open. We should open up, but also as we construct new rules to prevent bad behavior, it doesn't become as restrictive so that the green apples don't become bright, rosy red apples, and they're filled at the bad ones. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we, we do have Prashant coming back up on stage in just a minute. But before I let the three of you go, and thank you so much for, uh, for an insightful conversation, I'm going to start by asking each one of you 10 seconds each. We are talking about the decadal dividend, uh, Mr. Mistry. So, you know, what will be the preferred engine to your mind? Uh, do you believe that over the next decade we are going to see the consumption boom, or do you believe that it is going to be investment driven? I would say both consumption and investment. We've seen a lot of investments coming in the last several years. This year, consumption has been slow. I think consumption will also pick up. So in the next decade, you'll see both investments and consumption growing at the same pace. So that will give that double momentum to the economy. Same pace, do you believe that we are likely to see the convergence? Well, all uh, KK has already answered that, but I'll just give you another perspective to that. I think that uh, the key, really key breakthrough India will achieve over the next 10 years, since we're talking decadal here, uh, we've done financial inclusion at a reasonably good pace in the last five years, or maybe seven, eight years. But I think uh, the big story of the next 10 years is going to be uh, credit being available 
to uh, the, the lower end of the economy because thus far it's already been the large corporates who always got the credit. And I think that's, you know, we talked of animal spirits. We always think of animal spirits as large corporates, you know, all the, you know, billion dollar companies. But the animal spirits are sitting there below and that firing will happen in the next 10 years. And hopefully that credit gap, the yawning credit gap, at least as far as that constitutes. And will be great for many banks, including for us, of course. <laughs> of course, of course. That's what you're, that, that's what you're hoping for, Manish. I don't know if Vaidya is looking at his bank's balance sheet or a future in politics, <laughs> but he seems to be going in that direction. Could, could, could but uh, it could be both. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, you know, I think without investments, you don't get consumption. I, I actually think the only thing I'll say in a slight subtle shift to, uh, to Keki is, I do think if you look at this from a 50-year story, the next 10 years should be 75% investment and 25% consumption. If it's a 10-year story, it's half-half. But I really think what we are seeing today, and I mentioned that earlier in terms of the M Mumbai being only a small token of the landscape, when you're seeing 35 airports, and you see Mumbai airport, and you go to Heathrow, and you wonder which is the developed country uh, in the traditional sense of the developing country. So I think our uh, massive years ahead, I do think we need to put more in to reap the fruits in the future. Well, we, we hope that we will see more being put in on uh, both uh, enabling an environment to allow not just the large corporates to flourish, but also encourage the small and medium enterprises, which really are the backbone, especially as far as job creation is concerned, to do better. We hope that there is convergence and there is uh, that yawning credit gap that we spoke of, that that is an issue that is addressed. And some of the unfinished reforms that we spoke of, uh, we do hope that those are taken forward as well. Keki Mistri, Vivedanath and Manish Kejriwal, appreciate you joining us here. Thank you very much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Shireen. Thank you, Manish. Thank you, Mr. Misri. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vaidyanathan, uh, for a really uh, sort of uh, insightful discussion.